According to Medicare statistics, abdominal pain and chest pain are the two most common diagnoses presenting to emergency rooms. According to those same statistics, adults with back pain make up the majority of complaints to family physicians' offices. This is outpatient data. Whether you're going to practice family medicine, pediatrics, or whatever, a solid understanding of the physical exam, imaging, and possible causes of adult or pediatric abdominal complaints is a necessity. Welcome to this presentation on abdominal pain. Hopefully, you'll have a better understanding of the physical examination and diagnoses accompanying your patient's screams. The scheme for abdominal pain is not really user-friendly, and I can promise you it wasn't designed by a surgeon. Simply, it would have been easier to have a single pain scheme broken down by anatomical body parts. But it is what it is, and because of this scheme, there's a lot of overlap in how we try to categorize patients with different types of abdominal pain. We'll walk through some cases, there are about five in this presentation, and we'll talk about useful imaging, whether it's for acute or chronic pain or both, whether it's generalized, localized, or psychological in nature, and finally, we'll discuss what peritoneal signs are and what causes peritonitis. If you don't remember what the peritoneum is or the retroperitoneum, go back and think about the garbage can analogy presented early on this year. A review there might help and be a good place to start. Let's work our way through some learning objectives. First, you'll develop a general understanding of the scheme, how to use it by navigating through each node using information obtained from the patient's history, physical exam, lab studies, and imaging procedures. We'll contrast acute with chronic pain. And then we define generalized pain as compared to localized pain. And we give examples of each type of abdominal pathology. We also list the elements of peritoneal signs what they are, what causes them, and how we can use peritoneal signs to hone our physical exam and come to a better diagnosis. In addition to the patient presenting with acute or chronic abdominal pain, we'll look at referred pain, what it is and what causes it, and some examples. The underlying principles of physiology and anatomy causing abdominal pain will be introduced, and of course, we'll look at which imaging studies are most useful in assessing a patient presenting with abdominal pain, whether it is acute, chronic, referred, psychological, or otherwise. Continuing with some learning objectives, we'll need to describe and list sources of referred abdominal pain, and we also need to describe and list the principal mechanisms causing abdominal pain, and also ordering the proper imaging in evaluating a patient who has abdominal pain. We won't go through all of the imaging techniques. You'll have that in other lectures, but you do need to get down some of the basics. And we'll try to do that here. The first branch point of the scheme sends us to look at whether the patient is most likely complaining of an acute episode or a chronic exacerbation of a pre-existing condition, causing the patient's discomfort. And sometimes you can have acute on chronic symptoms. The scheme then splits into generalized, localized, and according to this scheme, referred pain would only be seen in a patient with acute pain. I'm not sure that this is completely true. I think this will make more sense later, though, as we move through some individual clinical cases and examples. Whether a patient presents with acute pain or an acute exacerbation of a chronic condition will make our first decision point a little bit easier. Chronic abdominal pain usually allows a bit more time for a more complete workup. Acute pain and a patient in extremis can result in a true emergency situation if not acted on immediately. We also mentioned the surgical abdomen, but as a surgeon, it's a term that I actually loathe. Not every patient presenting with signs of acute abdominal pain will have an abdomen requiring surgical intervention. It's not a very good term at describing the abdominal exam. The point of this slide, however, is simple acute pain could be urgent. If we look at some different presentations of abdominal pain, we do see that acute abdominal pain and chronic abdominal pain is an important decision point. Progressively worsening pain of an acute onset could also be the surgical abdomen, which may require immediate surgical intervention to prevent a disastrous outcome. Chronic abdominal pain generally, but not always, allows time for decision-making and management planning an opportunity to order the appropriate imaging studies or blood studies. 
Chronic abdominal pain with a sudden exacerbation or a sudden worsening could also become a surgical abdomen. Again, a very nonspecific term and a term that most surgeons really don't like to use. There are many reasons a patient can develop abdominal pain, both physiologically, structurally, congenitally, or even immunologically. The scheme seems to break down abdominal pain by whether it's acute, chronic, localized, or generalized, but in truth, it isn't really how I think about it. Most of the time after conducting and taking the full history and physical exam, you'll begin to make an educated guess as to why the patient has the pain. Do they booze and smoke? And probably peptic ulcer disease. Do they have a known history of autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus? Then you have to think immunologically. Maybe they have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Have they had chemotherapy recently? Then they may have tiflitis, which is inflammation of a specific part of the ascending colon, the cecum. What about diabetes? They might have gastroparesis, ketoacidosis, or a host of electrolyte disturbances related to their diabetes. And you can see, based on my reasoning, using the patient's medical history and old records, i.e. have they had an upper or lower endoscopy, you'll begin your diagnosis quickly and hopefully timely and accurately. Here we've listed some specific mechanisms for the development of abdominal pain. Mucosal ulceration as in peptic ulcer disease or gastric cancer. Altered motility as a result of gastroenteritis, i.e. the stomach flu. Inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome even diverticular disease. And of course, as I mentioned, metabolic disturbances, such as a patient who's in diabetic ketoacidosis, porphyria, lead poisoning, or even in odd rare cases, a blast crisis for a patient who is suffering an acute leukemic episode. Those are just a few of the mechanisms of abdominal pain causes. What about nerve irritation or injury? such as the rash caused by herpes zoster, or pain from a pinched nerve that can lead to abdominal pain. We see several mechanisms listed causing abdominal discomfort, nerve irritation, muscle injury, referred pain, i.e. from a source outside the abdomen, and psychological distress. All of these can cause a very real abdominal discomfort, necessitating uh, being seen in an emergency room. But here are other examples of the mechanisms of abdominal pain. Nerve irritation, trauma, like a rectus sheath hematoma, referred pain, and a rather common cause of abdominal pain, mostly but not always, in young, high school age or college aged women. Psychopathology. You have to think about the power of the mind over the body. It is a very real entity. One of the major causes of abdominal discomfort is caused by distension, by blood, fluid, or air of the intestines. Even an ileus, an ileus means a sick and somewhat paralyzed intestine, secondary to say the stomach flu, but even an ileus can cause abdominal pain. This slide shows us several causes of intestinal distension. It is this distension of the bowel and the subsequent pressing upon the parietal peritoneum that causes the patient discomfort. Here, we look at distension of the hollow viscous causing peritoneal irritation and vascular insufficiency. The intestinal wall can become so tight and distended, it actually cuts off its own blood supply, causing gangrenous intestines or mucosal ulcerations or slowing bowel motility or sometimes causing diarrhea. Liver capsule can become distended in a patient who suffers from congestive heart failure. They can then present with right upper quadrant pain. This is often confused for cholecystitis. You can have metabolic disorders causing abdominal pain. And we've mentioned nerve injury, abdominal wall injuries like the rectus sheath hematoma, psychopathology, and referred pain from extra abdominal sites, such as a heart attack, specifically a heart attack of the inferior aspect of the heart causing diaphragmatic irritation leading to nausea, vomiting, and subsequently abdominal pain. Several other mechanisms can cause abdominal pain, and the photos here are an attempt at demonstrating the serious nature of these cases. For example, intestinal obstruction caused from a tumor, a volvulus, 
or even an obstructed ureter can cause abdominal pain. When an abdominal organ loses its blood supply or has a diminished blood supply, catastrophic results can occur. These images show us a closed loop obstruction, i.e. a volvulized segment of small intestine with associated infarct intestine. Both would be surgical emergencies, of course. Sometimes a perforation can cause feces, blood, or bacteria to gain free access to the abdomen, causing an abscess. Even stomach acid or bile can leak from a perforation, causing significant inflammation of the peritoneal cavity, i.e. the GLAD bag analogy using uh, that uh, as causing peritonitis. Examining a patient in extremis, whether it's from a heart attack, loss of blood from an auto accident, or a rupturing abdominal aortic aneurysm may require you to take a history and physical exam and perform this all at the same time. Taking an exam while talking to a patient and not losing your train of thought takes some practice. Sometimes you will not have time to take any history and you'll be forced to act without knowing any of the patient's medical history or allergy history. It isn't ideal, but in those cases, you're trying to save a life rapidly. Ideally, you attempt to get the best medical history possible from the patient, including the chief complaint, and if there is time, the seven basic descriptive criteria of that chief complaint. In addition, it may be helpful to ascertain the sequence of symptoms. When did they first occur? Have you ever had pain like this before? If yes, when? Of course, asking whether the patient has developed fever or rigors can hint as to an infectious etiology of the abdominal pain and obstetrics patient can point to a bowel obstruction. Stones, whether kidney stones or gallstones, can present other diagnostic challenges. Just because a patient has gallstones or kidney stones does not necessarily mean they need to be removed urgently. Many, if not most, are actually asymptomatic and found incidentally while looking for other causes of pain. It's easy to forget to ask these questions especially if the patient is an extremist, but they could be important. Get into the habit of asking your female patients about their pregnancy history, an abortion history, or menstrual irregularities. For example, menorrhagia, metrorrhagia, amenorrhea, or dysmenorrhea. A sudden onset of abdominal girth and or asymmetric leg swelling can be a sign of ovarian or other gynecological malignancies. Let's start down the pathway of acute abdominal pain. This refers to pain of acute onset, generally less than 24 hours in onset. Examples include appendicitis, acute cholecystitis, ectopic pregnancy, sigmoid or cecal volvulus, perforated diverticulitis, perforated duodenal ulcer, and less lethal causes of acute abdominal pain, such as adhesive bowel disease, which can lead to obstruction. A glaring deficiency in our scheme is the lack of any attention to the pediatric patient the patient who can't voice their discomfort to you, a baby or a comatose trauma patient, for example. What then? Pediatric abdominal findings range from omphalocele um, to gastroschisis to midgut volvulus, pyloric stenosis, necrotizing intercolitis. It's a big list. So no, I don't like this scheme, but nobody asked for my opinion, and we'll have to work with the tools that are given to us. There are some causes of acute abdominal pain which require immediate intervention or the patient can quickly die. Examples such as a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, infarcted bowel either from an embolus or atherosclerotic vascular disease. The saying pain out of proportion to the abdominal physical exam is a huge red flag. The exam in an elderly patient can be misleading as they writhe and scream in pain while your exam shows a doughy, soft abdomen. This is usually a sign indicative of vascular compromise. But just for a minute, let's take a brief look at each of these images to see how important. For just a second, let's practice our powers of observation. And which one of these patients do you think represent true emergencies? The gentleman in the left upper, the three gentlemen in the left upper side of the slide, one is lying in bed, smiling, looking at his physician. 
Then there's the gentleman with the knife in his lower abdomen. I think we need to know. Uh, and then there's the gentleman in the left lower side of this slide who has a knife in his abdomen. He'll probably go to the operating room. Of course, there's the patient who most likely has suffered a, a catastrophic trauma as there's blood all over the operating room floor. He's already in the operating room and I'll bet that he got on that table quicker than any other patient has without a history of physical being done except very quickly to save his life. And of course, in the right lower aspect of the slide, a young girl is writhing in pain. She needs some attention. Is it an emergency? Maybe, maybe not. Um, the old joke, which I used to tell my patients is, we're running a little bit behind, so I'm gonna take whichever of you screams in agony the loudest. It was a running joke in my office, but there's some truth to it. The louder the scream, the more likely it is you'll get some immediate attention. So let's practice a bit. Which one of these patients with an acute injury seems to require immediate attention and possibly operative intervention? Which ones can you triage without further history or physical exam? The first image is of a baby with a emphalocele. You'll soon learn that this is often associated with many other congenital anomalies and has a very high mortality rate. Do the three gentlemen in the left upper quadrant of this slide seem to be an extremist? The patient is actually awake, alert, and talking to either his physicians or paramedics. In the left lower quadrant of the slide, we see a individual who has a knife injury to the right lower quadrant of his abdomen. He probably needs emergent surgery, but if he's clinically stable, we might be able to talk to him and get a history and physical exam and at least find out his allergies and if he's had a tetanus shot recently. In the right upper quadrant of this slide, we see an operating room where there's blood all over the floor. This patient needed emergency surgery and probably was whisked away to the operating room without a history or physical exam. And the young lady in the right lower quadrant of this slide is writhing in pain. Now, that brings us to the next question. Is he who screams the loudest always the one who gets the most attention? This comic says, we're running a little bit behind, um, but as uh, I'm going to take whichever of you screaming in agony the f is gonna go first. There's some truth to that, and sadly, the person who often yells the loudest isn't always the person who needs to be seen the soonest. Take a minute to read each of the common diagnoses found in the nine areas of this abdomen. In reality, we rarely speak of these nine regions. More commonly, we use only four with the umbilicus acting as the intersection point of these four quadrants. Look closely at these diagnoses and see how some do not seem to fit in the respective quadrant. Pancreatitis, for example, is in the right upper quadrant. Biliary colic in the left upper quadrant doesn't really seem to fit either. But you must keep an open mind when assessing any patient with abdominal pain. Learning about referred pain only makes your job a little more difficult. We'll address that in a minute. As part of this scheme, Generalized are, or localized are the next branch points. If the pain is diffuse throughout the abdomen, it's considered generalized. And if the pain can be assigned to a specific abdominal region or quadrant, it's considered localized. Pain patterns may also evolve, as in the classic evolution from visceral to periumbilical to right lower quadrant pain seen with the pain of acute appendicitis. Just keep an open mind. What kinds of abdominal pain present as generalized pain? Which kind present as localized? What types of abdominal pain could be represented by an acute pain episode of what was a generalized pain that later localizes? Appendicitis is the best example of this latter type of pain. According to the scheme, the pain is gonna be either localized or generalized. So let's look at some pathologies presenting often, but not always, as localized abdominal pain. We're sort of beating a dead horse with this slide. We're saying that peritoneal irritation is often caused by infection or chemical irritation. Chemical irritation being hydrochloric acid from a perforated gastric ulcer. Blood or bile spillage can also cause peritoneal irritation. Herpes zoster is a skin infection. It's extra abdominal. 
I list herpes zoster here because it can present without a rash in the precursor state and the patient can present with abdominal pain and it seems like he's masquerading as someone who has peritonitis, but he doesn't. Then there's capsular distension, well innervated digestive organs like the liver or the spleen. For example, a patient can come in with congestive heart failure, have a very high preload and the liver becomes congested. Glisten's capsule, which surrounds the liver, is then irritated to the point where it can masquerade as a peritonitis. I've seen more than one of these patients that are referred to me to take their gallbladder out when they actually have congestive heart failure. There's no need to remove their gallbladder. It goes on every day all over America. Surgeons see patients with congestive heart failure and right upper quadrant pain. Then, we have pancreatic inflammation or cancer or inflamed splanchnic nerves. Now these are retroperitoneal structures, but they can also cause, but they can also cause clinical signs consistent with a peritonitis. Let's go back and talk about the bare area of the liver here. You ever wonder why we teach this? I often did. I remember as a first year student putting my hand in the abdomen of a cadaver while my classmates read the dissector and feeling around, but not seeing the bare area of the liver. I had no idea why we were learning this. 20 years later, now I know. The bare area of the liver creates an argument that the liver might actually be retroperitoneal, except for this crown-shaped area on top of the liver that is not covered by peritoneum. Most anatomists will tell you that that area, i.e. the bare area of the liver, is the only retroperitoneal portion of the liver. So what? They say the liver is intra-abdominal, but the bare area has no peritoneal irritation. It's insensate to pain, and because of this, cancer or an injury could occur here and get fairly large by the time it grows large enough to stimulate the surrounding visceral peritoneum and subsequently parietal peritoneum. So when a patient walks in and has a giant metastatic liver lesion and you say to yourself, how could they have ever let it get to this size? Well, they didn't. They couldn't feel it growing. No pain fibers in the bare area of the liver. Now you know too. Lots of physical exam signs to learn. We'll go through each of these in your physical diagnosis of the abdomen. But let's talk about a few that are listed here. Murphy sign, usually associated with acute cholecystitis. It's the halting of a deep breath and inspiration when palpating the right upper quadrant because of the pain of underlying cholecystitis. A McBurney sign is basically pain in the right lower quadrant, which is associated with appendicitis. We'll talk about McBurney's point later. Rothsing sign is pain in the right lower quadrant while gently putting pressure in the left lower quadrant. A Gray Turner sign, bruising of the flank secondary to hemorrhagic pancreatitis or other retroperitoneal bleeding. CVA tenderness, usually a significant finding in hydronephrosis, pyelonephrosis, and sometimes kidney stones. An obturator sign is pain in the obturator canal on medial rotation and flexion of the hip used to identify a retroperitoneal appendicitis when the tip of the appendix is in a subsecal or even a retroperitoneal appendix location and not intraperitoneal. And we've already spoken briefly about the rigid abdomen caused by perforated viscera. Interestingly, a patient with cancer, which is spread all over the peritoneum, may have a completely benign abdominal exam. Again, the abdominal examination is imperfect, but done well, it can guide you to make an accurate and safe diagnosis. The imperfections of the abdominal exam have created a saying all general surgeons know. It's easy to know when to operate on a patient. The difficult part is knowing when not to operate. So which peritoneal lining is inflamed? Is it the parietal peritoneal lining, the visceral lining, i.e. intestinal distension, or both, acting together? The physical exam may not tell you. Actually, in fact, it probably won't tell you. But we do know that the visceral peritoneum is sensitive to distension. However, the parietal peritoneum is richly innervated with pain fibers. Rebound tenderness, i.e. more pain on the release of pressure, seems to suggest visceral irritation, but not always. Guarding is usually a result of muscle rigidity because the entire parietal peritoneum 
is inflamed, say from acid spilling as the result of a gastric perforation. So what we're really trying to do is make a decision on whether the patient requires more imaging or a trip to the operating room without any further diagnostic intervention. Sometimes we're wrong, but CT scanning, the preferred method of imaging for most GI complaints, has decreased the number of negative appendectomies and has virtually made the old-fashioned exploratory laparotomy a thing of the past. So here's the technical stuff, guarding and rebound. The last paragraph is probably the most important. Somatic nerves that innervate the parietal peritoneum also supply the corresponding segment areas of skin and muscle. When the parietal peritoneum is irritated, muscles tend to contract reflexively, causing localized hypercontractility, otherwise guarding. I don't like to generally read from my slides, but this slide is important, and you need to take a minute to go over, read it, and make sure that you understand it. The parietal peritoneum is innervated by branches from somatic, efferent, and afferent nerves that also supply the muscles and skin, respectively, of the overlying body wall. That's what we just said, and we said that in the previous slide. The visceral peritoneum is innervated by branches of visceral afferent nerves, which travel with the autonomic supply to the underlying viscera. So continuing. The different sensations arising from pathologies which affect either the parietal or visceral peritoneum reflect these differences in patterns of innervation. Well-localized pain, for example, appendicitis, is elicited by mechanical, thermal, or chemical stimulation of the nociceptors of the parietal peritoneum. The sensation is usually confined to one or two dermatomes for each area of peritoneum stimulated and is both lateralized and well localized. Go back and look at slide number 21, review slide number 22 and listen to this again so that you can clearly understand the innervation of the parietal peritoneum and of the visceral peritoneum. The fact your patient has generalized pain with peritonitis really doesn't help you in your diagnosis. A patient with a perforated duodenal ulcer spilling acid can cause a diffusely rigid abdomen. Even more, a patient with diffuse vomiting from gastroenteritis, i.e. the stomach flu, can present with generalized pain and peritoneal signs, guarding or rebound. It's because of this ambiguity that I like to teach future physicians to always dictate, quote, the abdominal examination suggests peritonitis with guarding or rebound, end quote. This little bit of wiggle room and or ambiguity in your dictation can allow you and or the surgeon to not compromise care if they discover a non-lethal diagnosis such as constipation or middle schmerz. The patient who presents like this, i.e. don't touch me, hurts all over the abdomen, consistent with, usually, a perforation and contamination of the entire abdomen, like a perforated duodenal ulcer, spilling acid contents throughout the peritoneal cavity. These patients truly have a rigid board-like abdomen, but you can see this with a bowel obstruction, where distension of the visceral peritoneum can actually cause translocation of bacteria through the bowel wall. This bacteria then, in turn, can cause a fibrinous exudate over the intestines. So in taking the brief history and an inspection of the patient, you must sometimes rapidly assess the acuity of the patient's symptoms. Does the abdominal exam suggest diffuse tenderness? Does the patient exhibit generalized guarding, rebound, i.e. more pain on withdrawal of the hand than with just a gentle pressure applied to the abdomen initially by the examiner's hand? The patient presenting with generalized abdominal pain with guarding or rebound may require urgent intervention, maybe to the point where they bypass all laboratory and radiographic studies and go straight to the operating room. Examples include ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms, although they usually present with associated and excruciating back pain with a distended abdomen because of blood collecting in the retroperitoneum or blood in the peritoneal cavity as a result of the aneurysm rupturing through the thin membrane of the retroperitoneum.
Another example is a ruptured perforated duodenal ulcer, acute cholecystitis with, with actual rupture of the gallbladder. This is very rare. Rupture of a sigmoid diverticulum with generalized fecal peritonitis, perforated jejunal diverticula, perforated appendicitis with abscess formation. All of this is a difficult diagnosis to make because of the peritoneal locations of the appendix. For example, is it subsecal? Is it intraperitoneal? Is it retroperitoneal? A retroperitoneal uh, appendicitis will present with back pain more so than abdominal pain. The point of this slide, however, is if a patient presents to your office with unstable vital signs, generalized abdominal pain with guarding or rebound, get them out of your office. Call 911 and arrange for the patient to be seen and sent uh, to the hospital immediately. So what about the patient who presents complaining of abdominal pain, but there is no guarding or rebound? Generalized pain without peritoneal signs could be an absolute emergency too. We often describe this exam as pain out of proportion to the findings. Most commonly, this type of examination is seen in elderly patients who have suffered a vascular insult. For example, embolic clot from atrial fibrillation blocking off the superior mesenteric artery or atherosclerotic occlusion of the SMA or other vessel resulting in infarcted bowel or infarcted bowel from an internal hernia or a volvulus such as a gastric volvulus, volvulus of the small bowel or a colonic volvulus. An internal hernia is where a loop of bowel becomes entangled through a hole in the mesentery. Just think of your garden hose. You carefully gather the hose, but for some unknown reason, when you unwind the hose, a loop gets caught in the coils of the, of the garden hose. It's the same idea. This slide demonstrates some causes of abdominal pain that may present without guarding or rebound. Sore muscles from too many sit-ups or frequent coughing. These are patients who may present with signs suggesting a surgical or an acute abdomen, but you don't want to take them to the operating room. The lower image on the right shows a rectus sheath hematoma, the white square, with a blush of contrast within the abdominal wall muscle. This tells us that there is fresh blood or active bleeding within the rectus sheath. The pain is akin, sort of like a compartment syndrome of the rectus muscle. The red arrows demonstrate either a fecal lith within the appendix, a small cecal diverticulum, either the common iliac vein or contrast within the patient's right ureter. It's hard to tell based just on this one image. The point is, would you take someone to the operating room who has abdominal pain from too many sit-ups? No, but they could present with diffuse abdominal pain with or without peritoneal signs. Abdominal pain is referred to or from another area of the body can be very frustrating to work up. Several good examples come to mind. Uh, for example, the patient with left upper quadrant abdominal pain secondary to a left lower lobe pneumonia. Another example is a patient who presents with generalized acute pain, eventually focusing around the umbilicus. This could be an early appendicitis, and by the time it localizes to the right lower quadrant, it may have perforated. Thus, generalized pain being referred to the umbilicus first, i.e. from an embryological highway left over from gut rotation. But what about epigastric abdominal pain, thought to be gastritis or peptic ulcer, when in actuality it's an inferior wall MI, causing diaphragmatic irritation and hence vomiting. And the more vomiting, the more sore the abdominal muscles. Lots of physicians have lost lawsuits over spending too much time looking for abdominal pain when it's actually chest or cardiac pain. Here's some examples of diagnoses referred to the abdomen from other sources. Another example in the female, cystitis, inflammation within the bladder from frequent urinary tract infections. It often presents with dysuria and or pain above the pubis with localization to the right or left abdomen leading to a workup for possible appendicitis or an abscess of a fallopian tube. Same with an ectopic pregnancy, generalized abdominal pain and only later with the pain localizing to the right lower quadrant or deep in the pelvis. Is that heartburn really reflux disease? Is that pneumonia really pneumonia or just atelectasis secondary to being unable to take a deep breath because of the chest pain? 
let's walk through these different sort of unreliable signs you'll learn about in a medical skills course. These are commonly assessed and the findings dictated in the medical record. Kerr sign, Murphy sign, Lloyd sign, Rovsink sign, obturator sign, etc. They can be overwhelming and are often only marginally useful in coming to the diagnosis. Remember though, medicine was barbaric up until the discovery of CT and ultrasound in the late 1970s. Before then, if you had a Rothsink sign, a normal white count, and no fever, you might go to the operating room for an exploratory laparotomy, otherwise known as let's go open up the abdomen and take a look. At one time, over 30% of such operations showed no findings requiring surgery. Ouch, that's a lot. Okay, your head swimming. Let's put together some of what we've talked about into a clinical case. Here we have a 65-year-old male who's presenting to the emergency room, complaining of on and off back and right upper quadrant abdominal pain, some nausea, some vomiting, and this morning was his most recent episode. He had pain like this last month, but it went away, and he does have a bit of a cough when it comes on. Says he had a normal breakfast. He eats steak and eggs for breakfast. But it was shortly thereafter, while unloading the contents of his semi-trailer, the pain started. He took some Tums, didn't help. Took some Motrin, didn't help. He says that he doesn't smoke, he doesn't take any other medications, and he doesn't use alcohol. What's going on? Well, his pain is classified as chronic on the scheme because it's occurred more than once and over a month or two. What could it be? So, right upper quadrant pain during physical labor second episode sounds like gallbladder maybe because of the back pain which might be Kerr sign although we don't talk about supraclavicular pain which is classic Kerr sign it could be peptic ulcer maybe pancreatitis or colitis we're not given a lot of history here um, and by the way these ultrasound images they're not even related to the case I put them here to support that you can in fact read these images I've outlined the pancreas for you, and the arrow shows fluid in the abdominal cavity in the retroperitoneum. In other words, an inflamed pancreas known as pancreatitis, not related to our case. So here's the scheme we should be looking at to assess our patient with chronic abdominal pain. I'm not sure that he exactly fits into chronic, but let's see where it takes us. Some examples. Chronic appendicitis. Yes, it does exist, despite what you may be, have been told. Diverticulitis, chronic or smoldering diverticulitis. It could be a angry gallbladder, chronic cholecystitis, or maybe even pain from chronic adhesions. It seems like we found ourselves in the localized box, but we need another box that says localized where, which quadrant. How does that affect our diagnosis? So just keep an open mind. We're not given enough information, but based on the patient's age, symptoms, onset, recurrence, it could be a number of things. It could be cardiac etiology. We haven't totally ruled that out. It could be source from the respiratory system, his lungs. We don't know that yet. It could be gallbladder disease. We're not sure. Take a look at these images, and especially the image on the far right that gives some various diagnoses based on the organs that are located in those quadrants. Again, it's just a guide. It's not definitive. As part of the workup on our patient with abdominal pain, let's get a standard chest x-ray, a PA and lateral view. In this image, it looks like a right lower lobe pneumonia. And if that's the case, he's having referred pain to the right diaphragm and the right side of his abdomen. Or is it from an intra-abdominal source with so much pain the patient is splinting as he's breathing, causing atelectasis that eventually led to a right lower lobe pneumonia. Maybe we should keep looking since the answer isn't quite so clear. As part of the ongoing workup for any patient of this age who's having right upper quadrant abdominal pain, it makes sense to get not only a chest x-ray, which we've seen, but also an EKG to rule out a cardiac source of the abdominal pain. Is the pain that this patient is experiencing referred from the myocardium? Well, let's look. What's the diagnosis on this patient who is presenting with abdominal pain? If we look at the rate, about 48 beats a minute, 
The rhythm looks like it's sinus. The axis isn't that important unless there's a tremendous shift. And for that, I'd like to compare it to an old EKG, which we don't have. Looks like there's some borderline hypertrophy uh, and probably an infarct with ischemia. The R progression seems okay. The impression here is it looks like our patient has an inferior wall MI. Referred abdominal pain along with nausea and vomiting and cough from diaphragmatic irritation secondary to a heart attack. So let's start some fluids. We've already got the chest x-ray. Maybe give him some nitroglycerin, morphine, oxygen, and consult a cardiologist to start some streptokinase or urokinase. And eventually, he's going to have to go to the cath lab. So in summary, our patient had an acute myocardial infarction with diaphragmatic irritation from an inferior wall MI with resultant right lower lobe or left lower lobe pneumonia. So here's a nice chart that summarizes some of those areas where referred pain is most commonly seen. Kerr sign is commonly encountered after laparoscopic surgery because carbon dioxide gas is used to insufflate and distend the peritoneal cavity so the surgeon can see what he's doing. If that carbon dioxide isn't completely uh, evacuated at the end of the procedure, the patient often wakes up and complains of pain in the right supraclavicular area and around uh, to the scapula and the inferior point of the scapula. We see ureteral pain radiating to the inner thigh, cardiac pain to the epigastrum, the right upper quadrant, the jaw, the left shoulder, the left arm. The appendix first starts periumbilical via the T10 nerve, and then as the appendix enlarges, it begins to irritate the parietal peritoneum. And of course, we look at the lower end of the chart. We talk about the gallbladder, the pancreas, and the bile duct with pain radiating to the epigastrium and sometimes even around to the back near the tip of the scapula. It definitely seems like we're out of sync. We finished our first case, yet we haven't really introduced how to do the physical exam for abdominal pain. The next few slides discusses the abdominal examination. I think the most logical sequence to examine the abdomen is first inspection and then auscultation and palpation, which can both be done at the same time together. And if the patient has no evidence of rebound or guarding, we might want to percuss the organs out and listen for any tympanitic sounds from distended fluid-filled or gas-filled intestines. I'll talk to you more about this as I'm afforded the opportunity to do so during your medical skills course. At this point in the presentation, it does seem like we're working out of order. We mention what can cause abdominal pain, i.e. the mechanisms, and we've even walked through our first case of referred pain, but in order to teach the abdominal exam, I needed to define guarding and rebound and referred pain. At least you'll have an idea of how to describe your physical examination on paper when you're doing it for your h &P. Of course, your first impression occurs at the introductions and handshaking. It might even occur today before the introduction as you look at the patient's diagnostic CT scan before you see the patient. The information from the scan forms an impression before you even walk in and introduce yourself. Once you do meet the patient, You'll be looking at the patient's monitors, whether they're jaundiced or lying perfectly still from the abdominal pain. You'll be looking at any pre-existing scars, edema of the extremities, clubbing of their nails, and a host of other points of simple inspection. Of course, if the patient is writhing on the emergency room bed, this can be an important sign. Are they febrile, tachycardic, short of breath, are they unable to lie still? Any obvious bleeding seen? Is the abdomen massively distended? Just taking a minute to look, inspect, and talk to the patient before the exam will often give you an impression leading you towards a more detailed workup or an emergent trip to the operating room. Remember, experience also comes from making mistakes. Learn from every error you make and try not to repeat those mistakes. The physical hands-on exam of the abdomen can lead to a diagnosis and many times it won't. But the list of items as seen on this slide are just some of the findings you'll come across. And frustration occurs when you operate on a patient with diffuse abdominal pain with tenderness and only days later 
does the rash of herpes zoster occur? Most general surgeons have been there at one time or another and made that mistake. The first comment here, avoid unnecessary discomfort, means don't use the patient for a pincushion. Don't use the patient where every medical student on the rotation repeats the physical exam. You do not need to palpate or show the residents or medical students and demonstrate a tender abdomen 50 times. Keep this professionalism in check at all times. Minimize discomfort to the patient. Obviously, physical pain can be caused secondary to pathology of the reproductive organs. A list of some of those pathologies are given here. Performing a pelvic or rectal exam on a patient in extremis may be unnecessary and may be significantly uncomfortable. There are pelvic exams performed to help a physician make a diagnosis. Sadly, CT scanning and ultrasound exams are often completed prior to the patient's complete physical exam, giving the clinician a false sense of security in the patient's diagnosis. But there are equivocal examinations performed where the pelvic examination will prove absolutely invaluable to assessing and treating a patient. For those equivocal exams to help rule out or rule in appendicitis, the chandelier sign, look that up, can be confirmatory for an ovarian or a salpinx abscess. You do need to use judgment, however, because if a patient is an extremis, for example, from a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, you can likely safely admit the pelvic exam before the patient goes to the operating room. It does require use of some common sense. Okay, now let's look at some diagnoses that fit this branch point of the scheme. We have a patient with abdominal pain, We've determined that it's an acute onset, it's localized to one of the four quadrants, and they have associated peritoneal signs. Let's go see what this could be. Acute abdominal pain, here we see two opposites of that spectrum. The first, infarcted intestine, the patient probably presented with pain out of proportion to the findings and without rebound or guarding. In contrast this with a perforated duodenal ulcer. In this case, the patient likely presented to the emergency room with a rigid, board-like abdomen with diffuse tenderness, guarding, rebound, and rigidity. Yet both patients would require emergency action, especially the infarcted intestine, probably caused from an SMA embolus in a patient with atrial fibrillation. I hesitate to use the word surgery on the patient with the perforated duodenal ulcer because data has shown that some elderly patients who are a very poor operative risk, can be treated with nasogastric suction, IV fluids, intravenous antibiotics, and in time, the perforation actually will seal over. But if the patient shows any signs of worsening vital signs or increasing pain, they'll have to go to the operating room regardless. So let's take a look at some cases where the patient presents with acute abdominal findings. Here are some examples of patients experiencing abdominal pain probably with peritoneal irritation signs, rebound, and guarding, where the pathology was a perforation. We see a patient who has a perforated sigmoid diverticulum, perforated peptic ulcer, and a perforated anterior duodenal ulcer. You may remember from your cardio and pulmonary courses that as part of the workup for abdominal pain, the quote, acute abdominal series, end quote, is often done. The acute abdominal series consists of an upright chest x-ray and a flat and upright view of the abdomen to assess for free air. When free air occurs, it's usually the sign of an intra-abdominal perforation, basically a hole somewhere that we need to fix, usually at 2 a.m. So this is a bit of a complicated slide to prove my point, but there are a lot of findings here. There's free air air in the biliary system, retroperitoneal air. This is not a good day for this patient. They've probably infarcted bowel, causing air in the portal vein, a result of gas-forming organisms in the bloodstream from the perforated bowel, and a rupture from a structure that is both intraperitoneal, i.e. the free air, and retroperitoneal, i.e. retroperitoneal air. That's my guess. Probably the duodenum a perforation from upper endoscopy since we have no history here. I'm just thinking through the findings based on my knowledge of the anatomy and the possible causes. 
If you use your anatomy, you can figure this out. Wow, what a great clinical case. Now tell me how a patient gets VTAC from pneumopericardium after an excision of a rectal polyp. Check out the photos from the attached article. A patient presenting with a bowel obstruction can present in excruciating pain from the distension of the small bowel or have an abdomen where pain is out of proportion to the findings, meaning a soft, doughy abdomen on exam, but the patient is an extremis. This is usually the sign of vascular compromise, and it can look like fluid-filled loops of small intestines. I put an abdominal film here for comparison that is probably normal. I say probably because I pulled it from the internet and don't know the patient's history or the exam, but just looking at it without a history or physical exam, it looks normal. The following slide shows infarcted intestines, and they were likely the result of an acute arterial event. You can also see acute venous events, such as acute mesenteric venous thrombosis, alcoholics come to mind or those already with cirrhosis. With chronic disease, such as atherosclerotic disease of the SMA, your patient has pain after eating. What does this mean? Well, he stops eating and loses weight. Your patient will present with weight loss, abdominal pain, and your CT scan will likely show diffuse atherosclerotic disease in the SMA. This finding will help you decipher whether it is a vascular insufficiency or SMA syndrome, usually seen in thin females, but in this case, the SMA has good blood flow through the SMA, which is widely patent. A patient presents with acute abdominal pain with or without peritoneal signs. If it's an acute arterial insufficiency that can result from atherosclerosis, an embolus from, say, atrial fibrillation, or even a sickle cell crisis. These patients can all present with severe abdominal pain, but have no evidence of peritoneal signs. Celiac trunk disease is usually characterized by nausea, vomiting, and bloating, since the celiac trunk supplies blood not only through the left gastric artery, the splenic artery, and the proper hepatic artery, but moving further down the aorta, we see the superior mesenteric artery, which presents usually with pain after eating in those patients who have disease of the SMA and weight loss. And then of course the inferior mesenteric artery which supplies blood to the descending colon these patients complain of constipation and blood loss through bloody bowel movements here's a patient who has suffered infarcted intestines this segment of intestine will need to be resected he probably presented with abdominal pain with diffuse tenderness and most likely pain out of proportion to the findings highly suggestive of a embolism to the superior mesenteric artery. Here also is a patient who probably presented with excruciating back pain but with abdominal distension. As you were taught in the cardiopulmonary course, an elderly patient who presents with back pain, syncope, and a pulsatile abdominal mass likely is suffering from a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Note, it's back pain because the aorta is retroperitoneal and most of the rupture is contained in the retroperitoneum. The tube graft on the left is rapidly becoming replaced with endovascular treatments, i.e. they slide the graft up through a femoral artery into the aorta, past the area of the leak or the rupture, and then they inflate the graft. <clears throat> but that isn't the point. Let's take a more detailed look at this patient who probably had hypotension, tachycardia, back pain, and maybe a palpable mass. So here's a good example of a patient who presents to the emergency room who's relatively thin and we should be able to palpate an abdominal mass. Let's say for example this is an elderly patient who presents with back pain and syncope, but let's say we can't palpate the abdominal mass. The quickest way is to use a cross table lateral plane x-ray. It is exactly what it sounds. An x-ray taken across the patient's abdomen. It's a plain film, and it usually shows us calcifications in the wall of the aorta. And from there, we can diagnose an abdominal aortic aneurysm, and then hence bypassing the usual imaging techniques and head straight to the operating room, or today, to the endovascular suite. In the images above, the aneurysm is not ruptured, but can be identified by the calcifications within the wall of the aorta. Back pain, blood in the urine, abdominal pain, 
bruising of the flanks, decreased pulses, those are all signs, all of the above. In this example, the aorta has ruptured and is now pouring blood into the retroperitoneum. And yes, this makes the dissection difficult because everything is stained red in the retroperitoneum and the tissue planes are often hard to identify and separate. How would this patient present? Syncope, maybe, back pain, hypotension, tachycardia, flank pain, hematuria, ecchymosis of the flanks, any combination of the above or all of the above. A good example where the distended abdomen and the physician's physical exam alone may not lead to the correct diagnosis, but if a palpable pulsatile mass is appreciated, it gives us a lot more information. Interestingly, my father passed from a large abdominal aortic aneurysm. He wasn't a surgical candidate. He had tremendous back pain, which to him didn't make sense. He called me from the emergency room and I explained to him that this was the big one. In typical, never to miss a chance to make a joke, he said, hmm, that doesn't sound too good. Yes, I laughed, even though I knew my father was ready to pass. So acute abdominal pain with generalized peritoneal signs? Probably not, probably just back pain. The workup might include only your physical exam if the aneurysm is ruptured. The best exam if you have time is a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast, but only if the patient's kidney function is normal, and that's probably unlikely. A CT scan is the best preoperative examination because it will show the common iliac and the internal and external iliac vessels, which may be too calcified to actually sew to. Or if an endovascular stent is being used, a CT scan will show just how tortuous those large vessels are, from the femoral artery back up to the external iliac, through the common iliac, abdominal aorta, and then to show us patency of the inferior mesenteric, superior mesenteric, and the celiac trunk. So which kind of repair is better for the patient presenting with an acutely rupturing abdominal aortic aneurysm? Now this is over your head for a first year student, but somebody always asks the question, so let's answer it. This paper recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine suggests that long-term complications occur with the aneurysm itself if the endovascular repair is used. That makes sense because the endovascular repair simply slides a graft through the aneurysm and past the rupture. The aneurysm is still left intact whereas complications related to the repair, i.e. hernias from the large incision, fistulas, i.e. connections between the aorta and the duodenum, called an aortoenteric fistula, are more common after the open repair. So it sounds like endovascular repair is quicker and less physiological straining on the patient who's in extremis as the open repair, open repair would be much more physiologically challenging, but neither are free of complications. At least you might survive the endovascular repair better than having your abdomen split open and a tube graft in, and then at least you have time now to worry about what you want to do about the aneurysm later, if anything. Part of the examination of the acute abdomen is to listen. Listen for what? Well, you're listening for the presence or absence of bowel sounds. Listen to the character of those bowel sounds. Rushes and tinkles indicate obstruction. Absence of sounds indicates infection or an ileus from, say, electrolyte disturbances. Or the presence of bruies. Bruies indicate turbulent blood flow. The most common example is in the carotid artery. The yellow line here marks the inferior epigastric artery and vein, i.e. branches of the internal thoracic vessels. Be careful. You put your stethoscope over the inferior epigastric artery and vein, hear the rush of blood through the artery, and think you found a renal artery or an iliac artery and a renal artery stenosis through the brewery. Nope. Move your stethoscope just a bit more lateral to find those. If your patient has generalized peritoneal signs, there really isn't a need to assess for rebound tenderness by pushing deeply and releasing. 
push softly and release. You'll get the same results. Further, if your patient has a tender abdomen with guarding, there is little need to percuss. Why? Because it hurts too much. Inspection, auscultation, palpation, with auscultation being performed simultaneously, and maybe percussion. If the abdominal exam is benign, percuss away. If it's tender, I wouldn't. It won't add much to your exam or for diagnostic support. Here's a suggested workup for your patient with abdominal pain. You can gain a lot of information from a plain x-ray of the abdomen. Actually, in most emergency rooms, it's called an acute abdominal series. We talked about this earlier, consisting of an upright chest x-ray and a flat and upright abdominal film to assess for free air under the diaphragm, i.e. a perforation. Don't forget the EKG, and if appropriate, don't forget the pregnancy test and the urinary analysis. Okay, let's look at another case and try to pull some of this information together in how we approach the patient. Our patient is an 80-year-old female who's complaining of abdominal pain. This 80-year-old nursing home resident who's previously had a left-sided hemiparesis from a stroke is seen in the emergency department complaining of abdominal pain for about the past 12 hours. The pain initially waxed and waned, but now it's constant. She's vomited a lot. She says more than 10 times in the past six hours. Her last bowel movement was last night. She said it was normal. There's no fever and there's no history of similar complaints in the past. Her past medical history is notable for a stroke and that has made her sadly bedridden. Social history, not relevant. No surgical history. Medications, an aspirin a day and she has no drug allergies. So it looks like grandma here has unfortunately had a left-sided paralysis from a stroke. She's been vomiting a lot. Could this be a heart attack? Could she have a rectus sheath hematoma from all the vomiting? Could this be gallbladder disease or perforated ulcer? Well, let's check out her abdominal exam in the next slide. Our patient has the following vital signs. Her temperature, 99.8. Respiratory rate's a little fast at 20. Her heart rate's 120. She's tachycardic. Blood pressure is a little low at 100 over 70. She doesn't look good, and she's lying there complaining of abdominal pain. There's no costovertebral angle tenderness. Her lungs are clear to auscultation. The abdominal exam is distended. She's got decreased bowel sounds. She's tympanitic to percussion with some diffuse tenderness, no obvious guarding or rebound, no masses are palpable, but She's obviously distended and she seems to have a fullness in the left lower quadrant. Normal tone, hemocult negative and brown stool on the rectal exam. Interestingly, a distended abdomen that's mostly quiet, but enough tympany to suggest an obstruction. She could have an ileus from electrolyte abnormalities. She could have an obstruction. She could have had a vascular event because She's generally tender, but she has no guarding or rebound. This could be an intestinal obstruction or it could be a vascular event. So let's get an EKG, an abdominal series, and a CBC. Uh, and it's safe to say that we can skip the pregnancy test. So based on the history and physical exam, we're thinking bowel obstruction, maybe a possible vascular event because her pain seems out of proportion to the findings. She's diffusely tender, but no guarding or rebound. In truth, we need imaging. We're not sure exactly what's going on yet. So let's start with an acute abdominal series. We can get some blood and urine studies. And of course, we can ask for help in just a minute, but let's get these studies first. So the EKG shows nonspecific ST T wave changes. Her urinary analysis is normal. The white count is 12,000. 86% polys and 15% lymphocytes. Her hemoglobin is 16, her hematocrit's 48, and her chest x-ray is shown. Just looking at it, we can see it's of a female patient. There's no COPD, it's a good inspiration. It has good uh, penetration, there's no fractures. Both lungs are expanded. There's no fluid, except for maybe just a little hint of fluid in both uh, costo diaphragmatic recesses, but basically there's no pneumonia, there's no infiltrates, and there's no free air. 
So the chest X-ray seems normal, which isn't too helpful. Her white count's a little high, and her hemoglobin hematocrit suggests that she's hemoconcentrated and dehydrated, but her UA is normal. So let's get some abdominal series and go from there. Here is the flat plate of her abdomen, and this shows a sigmoid volvulus. We'll talk more later about the radiographic findings that allow us to make the diagnosis of a sigmoid volvulus or a cecal volvulus or other types. So what is this? Our patient is distended and dehydrated and she's been vomiting because of an obstruction of a sigmoid volvulus. So our patient's a little atypical. She's presented with a sigmoid volvulus, which is a bowel obstruction of the distal large bowel. The most common cause of a bowel obstruction of the large intestine is cancer. So in this way, our patient's a little atypical. However, the most common cause of a bowel obstruction of the small intestine is adhesions, most commonly post-surgical adhesions. Other causes of small bowel obstruction are hernias, which is the second most common cause in the elderly, and they account for about 30% of acute small bowel obstructions. An indirect inguinal hernia, which is a little more common than femoral hernia, which is mostly seen in a female, and of course, a direct hernia. You may remember some of these definitions when we spoke about hernias as part of fascial defects. There's also ventral and umbilical hernias, which can cause small bowel obstruction. The mortality approaches 45% when emergency surgery is required for a bowel obstruction secondary to adhesions or from hernias. It's a significant amount of hospital admissions and hospital morbidity and mortality. This is from one of my patients. Here we see a patient who presented with acute abdominal pain almost monthly. Her family physician ordered a CAT scan, but nobody bothered to look at it, so she was bounced from doctor to doctor. Her pain was acute and onset, associated with a doughy abdomen, but difficult to examine accurately because of nausea and vomiting. She'd had the CT scan as mentioned, an ultrasound of her gallbladder, which was normal, a HIDA scan, which was normal. Both the HIDA scan and the ultrasound were ordered because of the right upper quadrant pain she was complaining of, but no Murphy sign or Kerr sign. Eventually, she had an upper endoscopy, looking for peptic ulcer disease and a colonoscopy probably done because of her pain and of her age. When she came to my office for her pain, she wasn't in any pain when I saw her, luckily. I did what nobody else had done. I actually looked at each of her studies. The CT scan done a few months before seeing me showed a loop of intestine sitting over the liver. I know you don't usually find intestine over the liver, so I scheduled her for a diagnostic laparoscopy and found an internal hernia of small bowel causing intermittent bowel obstructions with nausea and vomiting caused by the intestine being caught in the webs of adhesions over her liver, otherwise known as Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. She recovered uneventfully and thought I was a genius, but no, I just did my job and looked at her old records and radiographs. The radiologist had mentioned the finding of a loop of intestine over her liver, but nobody had actually bothered to look at the films. Our elderly patient, has a sigmoid volvulus. And we've already spoken now about the number one cause of a bowel obstruction in an elderly patient who may suffer from a large bowel obstruction. In that case, the number one cause isn't volvulus, but it's usually cancer. Small bowel obstructions, as mentioned, are usually caused by adhesions. If a small bowel obstruction is suspected, the patient can present with a distended, diffusely tender abdomen and rebound or guarding could suggest compromise of the patient's underlying bowel made by an internal hernia. Think of your garden hose when you untangle it and a knot forms despite how well you've wound the hose up before you stored it away. The plane of abdominal film will likely show as dilated loops of small intestine with air fluid levels. In this image, it's those air fluid levels along with the distended small bowel and again, how do I know it's small bowel? Well, we can look and see the valvulae conventes, 
which are also known as plica circularis. And that's how I know that it's distended small bowel and not distended large bowel. I know this film was taken with the patient standing in the upright position because of the air fluid levels. If the patient was lying flat, you wouldn't see those levels. The fluid would just spread out flat. But is it a mechanical, i.e. a cancer, an adhesion, or a foreign body causing the abdominal obstruction, or is it a functional obstruction? That is an ileus. An ileus is basically a segment of intestine, or even the stomach, that doesn't peristalts. It just lies there. It doesn't move and doesn't push fluid or chyme through. This can happen if the patient has an electrolyte abnormality, potassium is the most common, is postoperative after a bowel resection, or recovering, say, from the stomach flu. That's why you vomit when you have an ileus, because nothing is moving through the intestines, and the only way to get fluid out and decompress the small intestine is to vomit. Or if you're in the hospital, place a nasogastric tube into the stomach and place that tube to suction. This film shows multiple air fluid levels, and we have to remember the difference between the mechanical obstruction versus the functional obstruction. Most twists of the colon are sigmoid, about 75 to 80%. Males and females share about the same incidence. A sequel volvulus usually occurs in men and accounts for about 20% of all volvulus cases. Interestingly, my personal operative experience has been that more females than males suffer from sequel volvulus, but truthfully, that's useless anecdotal information. This image shows a late complication of volvulus, that is necrosis. This patient will require resection of the affected portion of the colon. An elevated white count, hypotension, and fever are highly suggestive of bowel infarction. When a patient presents with a volvulus of this type, they may present with acute or even subacute onset of colicky pain that waxes and wanes. The pain often persists between the uh, spasms of the bowel. They may or may not have vomiting, and they may or may not complain of constipation. Abdominal distension can be a late finding, and the abdomen is often not initially tender. But as we mentioned, elevated white count, fever, and possibly septic shock suggest strangulation or incarceration. These patients will require fluid resuscitation to replace any intravenous fluids which have third spaced into the bowel and probably preoperative antibiotics. In our evaluation of the elderly patient who presents with a possible bowel obstruction, we're very likely to obtain either plain films, CAT scans, or both. On this coronal view of the CT scan, we can see how the mesentery has coiled around itself creating a whorl sign. A volvulus can usually be diagnosed from abdominal films about 60% of the time. The plain abdominal films will often show large dilated loops of colon with air fluid levels too. Let's take a look at another type of volvulus. We've looked at sigmoid volvulus. Now let's look at a sequel volvulus. Notice how similar it looks in the abdominal film to that of the sigmoid volvulus. And sometimes, truthfully, you can't tell what type of volvulus the patient has, and a CT scan may show us, again, the world sign. Then we can usually determine if it's large bowel or small bowel mesentery that's twisted. In these films, notice how the curve of the twist is away from the cecum. I use the example of the protractor, where the angle of the protractor is away from the cecum. Hopefully this will make sense as we look at the comparison between the sequel volvulus and the sigmoid volvulus x-rays. So remember, there are less common causes of bowel obstruction in an elderly patient besides colon cancer, volvulus, and hernias, especially an internal hernia. When a patient presents with an internal hernia, it may be impossible to diagnose this on physical exam via the history or even abdominal films, which may only show a bowel obstruction and not the actual cause of the obstruction. Most patients presenting with an internal hernia have usually had some sort of bowel resection in the past. After the bowel is removed, a wedge of mesentery is usually taken with the segment of bowel. This leaves a defect in the mesentery, which must then be closed. Later, the mesenteric sutures either pull through or become loose, 
and it allows another piece of bowel, usually small intestine, to become entrapped within this defect. It can then obstruct, twist, become strangulated, and eventually necrotic. The images here show an internal hernia which is specific to those patients who have undergone a certain type of gastric bypass surgery. It's called a Peterson's hernia. Look at these images closely to make sure that you understand how a Peterson's hernia can occur. The picture in the lower right shows a standard internal hernia which can result when a segment of small bowel slides through a defect in the mesentery. That defect, as I mentioned, is usually caused from previous surgery. Our first priority is to resuscitate the patient before we take them to the operating room. This means replacing their fluids and giving preoperative antibiotics and attempting non-operative means of reduction of the volvulus. A sigmoid volvulus can sometimes be reduced by inserting a colonoscope slowly and gently to untwist the colon and remove the trapped air. This allows blood flow back to the colon by decreasing the pressure within the lumen of the colon. Sometimes this can be done by inserting a column of liquid barium sulfate done by the radiologist. This is risky because barium, should it perforate the colon and leak into the peritoneal cavity, can be deadly. But a small amount of barium inserted can be diagnostic as well as therapeutic. For example, this final image shows a column of barium flowing up to the twist point. Here, the bird's beak appearance of the sigmoid volvulus is diagnostic on this study. Let's look at the acute abdomen presenting with generalized pain, but no guarding, rebound, or rigidity. This is truly why I don't like the term surgical abdomen being used as a synonym for an acute abdomen. Over the next slides, we'll see examples of patients presenting with an acute, but a non-surgical abdomen. Of course, CT scanning has provided us with immense information to sort out the acute abdomen from the surgical abdomen. Imagine being a victim of gastroenteritis or food poisoning or a food allergy that causes nausea, vomiting, and maybe some diarrhea. The sore abdominal muscles from vomiting could be mistaken for guarding or localized pain. Vomiting, in turn, could also result in a rectus sheath hematoma, tender, distended, and maybe with even a quiet abdomen. These are the patients that we don't want to operate on, and thankfully, they rarely end up there. But sometimes, we can't know for sure what the pain is from, and the CT scan, the labs, and physical exam, as well as the history, just leave us confused. For those patients, a diagnostic laparoscopy can be done. That's laparoscopy, not a laparotomy. Laparoscopy is using a camera or a scope without completely opening the greater sac of the abdomen and performing a hands-on exploration. Acute generalized abdominal pain can usually occur with a recent viral infection, such as acute gastroenteritis. In these patients, they can present with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, and those with a history of alternating constipation and diarrhea, which has occurred over a long time, can be a sign of irritable bowel disease. These patients can also have some abdominal distension, and the pain can be described as colicky. These disorders are usually heralded first by the diarrhea, and later the bloating and or the vomiting. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes it's vomiting and then diarrhea, with pain occurring only after the bouts of emesis. But these are all very soft diagnostic signs. Either way, the examination can show a doughy soft abdomen with guarding or with rebound or rigidity. In these patients, we'll need to rely on the history of the exam, the normal abdominal films, and probably the normal CBC. The physical exam in these types of patients can often show normal vital signs, no fever, but some underlying hypertension or tachycardia just generated from the pain alone. Usually, the patient presents in no acute distress and the abdomen is soft and non-tender. The blood work, which is usually the same that we perform for any patient with acute abdominal pain, usually consists of a CBC, a urinary analysis, an erythrocyte sedimentation rate, 
which is a marker for underlying inflammation, and a comprehensive metabolic panel, which is Medicare's term for a set of liver enzymes, a set of electrolytes, glucose, BUN, creatinine, calcium, and a couple other markers. Imaging may or may not be indicated depending on what our blood work and our physical exam shows. The treatment's usually empiric for the symptoms of nausea and vomiting, and sometimes we will actually admit this patient for observation. It's always in the patient's best interest when they present with abdominal pain or chest pain, and you can't give them a definitive diagnosis from the emergency room. You should admit these patients for observation. It's just safe and good medicine. That little bit of extra time allows for some intravenous hydration, antibiotics if indicated, and some pain control. Sometimes it allows for a psychiatric evaluation also. Patients who are constipated can present with a generalized abdominal pain. In constipation, the peritoneal signs may be absent, but you might actually feel a palpable mass. That mass is usually a impacted colon, which is full of feces. Sometimes these patients' abdominal pain, which is again generalized, is a result of constipation from inadequate water intake, inadequate fiber, or from travel, no exercise, or even a result secondary to underlying narcotic use. Constipation as a cause of abdominal discomfort is common. Sometimes it is impressive how bad the constipation is based on the interpretation of the abdominal film. These patients, ironically, can present with diarrhea. How can that be? It's called overflow diarrhea. The patients have actual so much constipation that the liquid stool will find its way around the impacted colon and present with diarrhea. Sometimes these patients will require manual disimpaction in the operating room under anesthesia. Other times a gastrographin enema will do the trick. If you remember, gastrographin has a very high osmotic effect. As a rule, however, these patients should be cleared of their fecal load from below. Avoid giving them medications orally as it will usually not work and only increase the crampy abdominal pain and distension. And further, what if there's an obstruction in the distal colon that you can't see? You don't want to cause a perforation by trying to clean such a patient out from above by using an oral cathartic. Then there's usually the female patient who presents with localized lower abdominal pain who may actually have peritoneal signs. We treat these patients the same. We ask about their sexual history, possible pregnancy, rectal bleeding or pain after eating, whether they've experienced weight loss or loss of appetite. And we assess for any underlying disorders of atherosclerotic vascular disease or coronary artery disease that may be present depending on their age. Labs should always include a UA, a pregnancy test in all females of childbearing age, whether or not they've had a tubal ligation is usually not relevant, a CBC to check the white count and to check for any underlying anemia. They may require a CT scan, an MR angio, or an ultrasound. Truthfully, women presented with abdominal pain are often the largest diagnostic challenges. Of course, don't forget the pregnancy test in women of childbearing age because even if they've had a tubal ligation or at least think they've had a tubal ligation and depending on who, where, and how the ligation was done can still leave the patient open to the possibility of an ectopic pregnancy. If the pregnancy test is negative, then proceed normally with your diagnostic and imaging workup. Most gynecologists will prefer a pelvic exam be performed in conjunction with a pelvic ultrasound. Personally, I find CT scanning easier to interpret for me, but that isn't true for most gynecologists as they're truly experts at female ultrasonography. But what about the patient who presents with left lower quadrant pain and the underlying cause is presumed to be diverticulitis? What is diverticulitis and what are diverticuli? We'll explore those in the next few slides. Older adults may not demonstrate any abdominal pain, fever, or peritoneal signs with an episode of diverticular disease, specifically 
diverticulitis. A markedly elevated white count may be the only finding, and it's best diagnosed on CT scan. Abdominal CT is the imaging modality of choice for immediate confirmation of diverticulitis. So what exactly are diverticuli? Diverticuli are outpouchings or protrusions of all or a portion of the wall of a hollow viscous. They can occur anywhere in the GI tract. They can be either a true or a false diverticulum. A true diverticulum contains all layers of the wall of the bowel. A false diverticulum doesn't. It may only contain a serosal layer or a small lining of the muscular layer. They're often divided into pulsion or traction diverticuli, depending on the cause. Traction diverticuli are a result of these outpouchings which occur adjacent to a site of inflammatory disease. For example, a mid-esophageal diverticulum can be the result of being pulled towards a site of inflammation in the chest, such as sarcoid or TB. And they can occur anywhere in the GI tract, the esophagus, the jejunum, the ileum, or the colon. The image here shows diverticuli in the small bowel. They will contain all of the layers of the small bowel. The Zinker's diverticulum is a pulsion diverticulum. It only consists of the mucosal layer of the pharynx being pushed posteriorly through the cricopharyngeal muscles through a defect in Killian's triangle. Here's an image of diverticulosis of the sigmoid colon as seen during open laparotomy. Each red circle shows a diverticuli filled with impacted feces. It doesn't contain popcorn or sesame seeds, corn kernels. It only contains hard, impacted poop. I've never seen a patient presenting with perforated sigmoid diverticulitis whose diverticuli are filled with seeds or popcorn or sesame seeds. Never. Do not tell your patients to avoid popcorn, corn, or sesame seeds for fear of developing diverticulitis. This simply is not true and is not the case. Here are three images showing three separate patients, but all showing diverticular disease. The arrows here show the pockets of diverticulosis as seen during the colonoscopy. A small hyperplastic benign polyp is also circled. Diverticulitis is often referred to as the left-sided appendicitis. The patient usually presents with a left lower quadrant pain, fever, elevated white count, and can develop any of these complications of diverticular disease. The common complications of diverticular disease include bleeding in diverticulosis, and in diverticulitis, stricture with bowel obstruction, perforation, abscess, and fistula. You need to memorize these five complications of diverticulitis. Diverticulitis usually presents as persistent left lower quadrant pain with a palpable tender mass. You have an independent lecture devoted to diverticular disease, so we'll only touch on it here. These images show a complication of diverticular disease, and that is bleeding. Diverticulosis bleeds. Diverticulitis does not bleed. We believe, but we don't know for sure, that diverticuli occur as a result of a weakness in the bowel wall at the point where the blood vessel actually enters the lumen of the bowel. That's what these pictures are trying to show us. Let's take a look further at some more diverticulosis. Diverticulosis often is a result of mechanical blockage of the mouth of the diverticulum with impacted fecal matter. They also believe that raised intraluminal colonic pressures can contribute to the formation of the diverticulum itself. Diverticuli are most common in the sigmoid colon and at one time was thought to be secondary to a low fiber diet as it is found in 20% of people over 40 years of age and it increases to 70% of the people over 70 years of age and 15% of these will develop diverticulitis. There is some data today that actually suggests low fiber diet may actually not be the cause of diverticular disease. Let's review a little bit of what we've learned about bowel obstruction in the elderly patient. The most common cause of a large bowel obstruction, of course, is cancer. There's lots of information here, and we're going to discuss diverticular disease in depth 
in a later lecture. You do need to memorize the five complications of diverticular disease. You'll need to know them eventually, and this is very relevant. A stricture is a narrowing caused by the inflammatory fibrosis to the wall of the colon as a result of the inflammatory response in diverticulitis. A fistula is an abnormal communication between two epithelialized surfaces. A belly button ring is a good example. A pierced earlobe is also a fistula between two epithelialized surfaces. Diverticular disease can cause abnormal communications between the colon and the bladder, between the colon and the uterus, between the colon and the small intestine. The other complications are obvious and we'll look at them later. Of course, we've seen examples of volvulus of the sigmoid and cecum. There's also volvulus of the transverse colon, which can occur. In general, volvulus accounts for about 3 to 5% of intestinal obstructions in the elderly patients. The predisposing factors include the use of anticholinergics, a sedentary lifestyle, and chronic constipation. Even today, in an elderly patient, the mortality rate of a cecal, sigmoid, or transverse colon volvulus can range between 25 and 40%. We used to give an entire lecture devoted to chronic abdominal pain. I think it's easier to show examples than to try to explain all of the diagnoses supporting chronic abdominal pain. We first introduced this scheme in your first case. Go back to slide 30. And yet, here our scheme doesn't seem to recognize referred chronic pain. I've added this box because the scheme is incomplete. It seems like we've left out something. Even our first case was an example of chronic pain, but it turned out to be an MI. Maybe even chronic angina? Is that really chronic abdominal pain? Let's take a look and try to clarify this. So here we have a 75-year-old female with a history of chronic constipation who now presents with four days of vague abdominal pain, and today it's worse. There's no fever, no nausea or vomiting or diarrhea. She's had a long-standing history of similar abdominal pain with an extensive workup in the past. She's actually requesting an enema. Past medical history is notable for non-insulin-dependent diabetes, degenerative joint disease, and her past surgical history is notable for a hysterectomy with removal of both ovaries and tubes. She's not allergic to any medications, and she takes gliburide, and Motrin. Her vital signs show a temperature of 101. Her blood pressure is elevated at 160 over 70. Her respirations are normal and her heart rate is also normal, maybe a tad high at 90. She appears comfortable. She has normal and clear skin and lungs. Her cardiovascular and respiratory system show no wheezing or rock eye. She has a regular rate and rhythm with a 1 over 6 systolic ejection murmur at the left lower sternal border. Her abdomen is actually not distended, it's scaphoid. She has normal bowel sounds. She's a little tender in the right lower quadrant to palpation, but no real guarding or rebound, and she has no masses palpable. Rectal examination showed a normal tone, no blood, and hemocult negative. The pelvic exam showed a palpable vaginal cuff, but no masses. This patient is tachycardic, febrile, hypertensive, and tender in the right lower quadrant for four days. Is four days really the definition of chronic abdominal pain? With the history and physical exam findings, what are you thinking? What would you like to do now? What do you think it is? Should we treat her? How? And how should we treat her? Should we just reassure her that this is just her usual chronic pain? What test do we want to order? Should we actually send her to the emergency room? Well, it's safe to do our usual workup. So we send a urinary analysis, and it shows 2-plus leukocyte esterase, but no bacteria and no red cells. Does she have a urinary tract infection based on this? We do an EKG, and it's normal. So she probably isn't having a heart attack. Her white count is 9,000 with a left shift, 92% polymorphonuclear leukocytes and 8% lymphocytes, most consistent with bacterial infection. 
but the total white count isn't elevated. But remember, she's elderly. You don't always see an elevated white count in elderly patients who present with severe catastrophic uh, abdominal emergencies. Her hemoglobin and her hematocrit are normal, and we're not given the MCV. So we have a history, a physical exam, some basic lab studies. They may be suggestive of an underlying urinary tract infection, but is that all she could have? If it's not a UTI, what are we going to do now? I think it's safe because of this com patient's complaint of chronic abdominal pain that we actually either get the old CT scans to review or get a new CT scan. So here is the patient's CAT scan after she's had oral contrast. What is it that is identified by the white arrow and what's identified by the yellow arrow? Well, if you're confused, we see that the rectum has contrast in it. The white arrow is showing a fecal lith and the left arrow is showing an abscess forming around this fecal lith in the appendix. She has appendicitis. In other words, she's had four days of pain. She may have a perforated appendix. Again, is this chronic appendicitis? What was the cause of her chronic abdominal pain? Well, we've made a diagnosis of probably perforated appendicitis with a small abscess. We take her to surgery after the CT scan had suggested appendicitis, and we perform an appendectomy. During surgery, she was found to have a perforated appendix with diffuse peritoneal soiling in the pelvis appreciated. If you'd like to see a video of a laparoscopic appendectomy, please click on the link provided. Appendicitis qualifies for chronic pain only if the patient has chronic long-standing appendicitis. Yes, it's rare, but it exists and about every surgeon has seen a case. Chronic appendicitis is an inflammatory process of the appendix that resolves. Say, for example, the obstructing fecal lith is extruded or expelled from the appendix, and then later it recurs. A better example of chronic abdominal pain is mesenteric ischemia, from atherosclerotic disease or chronic diverticulitis or chronic biliary colic from underlying chronic cholecystitis or even chronic gastritis or chronic adhesive disease, chronic endometriosis, and a plethora of other diagnoses. But let's look at some of the statistics for appendicitis. Generally, 5-7% to of abdominal emergencies in the elderly is attributable to acute appendicitis, not chronic. Up to 70% are perforated at surgery and about 20% in the non-elderly. Up to about 50% are misdiagnosed preoperatively and the mortality approaches 25% versus less than 1% in the non-elderly. As CT scanning and operative technology becomes better, these numbers will also improve. When elderly patients present with acute appendicitis, Almost 100% of them have abdominal pain, but it's poorly localized. Less than 35% will have the typical pain patterns of pain first at the umbilicus, then radiating down towards the right lower quadrant. 85% have right lower quadrant tenderness on palpation, but less than half of these will have evidence of an acute abdomen. Less than half have no guarding or rebound. And fever is also highly variable. It can occur in 25 to 70% and 30 to 75% can present and be afebrile. Some of the risk factors for developing appendicitis include the male sex. Perforation rates are higher at both extremes of age, meaning the very young and the very old. Economic status. The higher perforation rates are seen in economically disadvantaged populations. The assumption here is that these patients do not present early because they lack health insurance or an ability to pay. The diet, populations that consume diets low in fiber and high in refined carbohydrates are at risk, but this is also defined as a risk factor for diverticular disease, and now we are beginning to doubt this. Genetics is interesting. Those who have a history of appendicitis and a first degree relative is associated with a three and a half to a 10 times relative risk for developing the disorder. And they say more cases occur in the summer months. I'm not sure that that's necessarily true and extended breastfeeding. 
appears to diminish the risk of developing appendicitis in a child. Interestingly, in my experience, a risk factor for appendicitis was a patient who was undergoing a great amount of stress in their life, either a new job or moving or marital difficulties or financial difficulties. Almost always, there seemed to be some type of acute stress in the patient's life. I can't prove this, just an observation. In our evaluation of a patient who presents with possible appendicitis, the white count is elevated in 75 to 80%. However, up to 20% will have a normal white count with a normal differential. Plain x-rays are not helpful at all. Ultrasound is supposed to be predictive if the appendix measures greater than 6 millimeters across and if the appendix is non-collapsible, swollen, surrounded by edema. But beware of these non-diagnostic studies. They're rarely helpful in adult patients. Ultrasonography is highly variable. CT scanning is the best and it is excellent for those equivocal cases. Today's technology does not necessarily require that the patient have oral or intravenous contrast. Of course, in the classic presentation of appendicitis, the patient usually presents first with periumbilical pain, which within about an hour or two will localize to the right lower quadrant. It's often associated with anorexia and, as we mentioned, maybe an elevated white count. Symptoms common to adolescents and young adults can include right lower quadrant pain with fever, without fever, dysuria in some, and some even complain of no pain at all and present with back pain. Older patients can present with chronic appendicitis resulting from a fecal lith that we've already mentioned, and localization may not always be present in the right lower quadrant. Be aware of the possible retrocecal appendix. As mentioned, those patients will come in with back pain. There are a variety of physical examination signs which are supposed to be indicative of appendicitis, and you'll learn these in medical skills. If you click on the link provided, it'll take you to a site where all of these various physical exam signs are demonstrated. You'll learn about Rothsing, psoas, and obturator sign. In truth, with today's high-resolution CAT scans, most of these are not very helpful and often only complicate and make the examination even more ambiguous. Most studies in the pediatric population have suggested appendicitis if the appendix measures more than six millimeters in diameter. I'm not sure that I would trust this number alone. I need a good physical exam, a history, and very clear ultrasound pictures. Here we see an example of ultrasonography on the left, and on the right, we can see an inflamed appendix, which is pointed out to us by the white arrow. So in summary, elderly patients are much more likely to present with atypical findings, often no fever, no white count, back pain instead of right lower quadrant abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, and a benign abdomen. Don't expect fever or an elevated white count. But if you're concerned, send the patient to the emergency department and order a CAT scan. Okay, let's look at another case. Here we have an 81-year-old African-American female whose past medical history is notable for hypertension, type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, and she had a heart attack five years ago. But for the past two years, she's had chronic abdominal pain. She was admitted to the hospital with worsening of this same abdominal pain over the previous two to three days. She doesn't have any chest pain, no shortness of breath, and she complains of only nausea and vomiting. Her vital signs show a temperature of 38.8. She is hypertensive with a blood pressure of 210 over 100 millimeters of mercury. And her abdomen shows some right lower quadrant tenderness, no rebound, and it's soft. She has bowel sounds. The rest of the examination was unremarkable. On our laboratory test, we sent off a CVC, a comprehensive metabolic panel, an amylase and a lipase to look for underlying pancreatitis, and a urinary analysis, and all returned as normal. The abdominal films didn't tell us anything. She was started on IV fluids, given some pain medication, and Zosin, an antibiotic, 
for an elevated temperature of about 100.9, a little less than when she was admitted. Blood cultures were obtained, and a CAT scan performed showed a dilated stomach, a 3.6 centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm, which was no change, and some old renal cyst. What other tests are needed? Well, right off the top, this is a lady with severe hypertension who presents with abdominal pain and a fever. For one, we should get an EKG and a chest x-ray. Well, let's look at her EKG. Uh, looks like her heart rate's about 70. She has deep Q waves in lead three, and she has inverted and deep T waves throughout the precordium. This is highly suggestive of an old MI or ongoing ischemia. Let's get some cardiac enzymes. So we still have yet to explain the patient's fever, but she is severely hypertensive and has a low-grade fever in addition to right lower quadrant pain. But our EKG suggests an acute MI, and our final diagnosis was a non-ST segment elevation MI. The patient underwent coronary catheterization, which showed a 99% occlusion in one of the branches of the circumflex. She had two stents placed. The right coronary had about a 90% proximal stenosis, but stent placement and percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty were unsuccessful. The patient was then scheduled for a repeat catheterization for stent placement trial again in two to three weeks of that right coronary. So what did we learn from this case? Well, I can tell you personally, I'm still uncomfortable with this patient's presentation. She has a fever, which would be uncommon in a patient suffering an MI, and she still has right lower quadrant abdominal pain. Don't forget, not all right lower quadrant pain is appendicitis, but on the other hand, not all EKGs showing a heart attack are the only finding your patient may have. If this patient is elderly and frail, it is possible that the pain and discomfort of an abdominal event could cause enough stress and cause a heart attack. Always keep in mind the possibility of an acute MI in patients with those risk factors, even with the atypical symptoms. An MI may be completely painless in some women and in diabetics. And you don't need all the symptoms of chest pain to diagnose an MI. The moral to this story, not all right lower quadrant pain is appendicitis. And it is very possible that an elderly patient can present with appendicitis and a concurrent MI. So now let's look at a case of an acute localized abdominal pain episode that has peritoneal signs. Specifically, let's look at cholecystitis and peptic ulcer disease. So let's look at an episode of right upper quadrant abdominal pain localized with peritoneal irritation. In a patient who has acute cholecystitis, they may have a sudden onset of right upper quadrant pain, usually after eating. The pain can radiate to the right shoulder or the scapula, also known as Kerr sign. They can present with fever, jaundice, or biliary colic. The pain onset is usually an hour to three hours after eating. The pain progresses slowly, getting worse with time, and it lasts between two to six hours. It's not uncommon to wake patients up from their sleep. Sometimes the labs can be normal, but usually they present with an elevated white count and sometimes a bump in the liver function enzymes, but not always. 80% of patients will have gallstones on ultrasonography, and the treatment is a cholecystectomy. In patients presenting with acute cholecystitis, we know that cholesterol stones are the cause of biliary colic in about 80% of cases. Stones can also be mixed or made up of bilirubinate crystals. Those account for about 20% of gallstones. Obstruction of the common bile duct and possible obstruction of the pancreatic duct can lead to something called gallstone-induced pancreatitis, i.e. the dual channel theory. If stones are only in the common bile duct, that's referred to as cholidocolithiasis, and these patients may or may not have Murphy sign on a physical exam. Patients who present with right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, and fever are said to have Charcot's triad. This is common in patients who have cholidocolithiasis with acute cholecystitis. 
cholangitis results when you have stasis of bile and subsequently infection of the gallbladder resulting in right upper quadrant pain. Cholangitis is serious and it requires the common bile duct to be cleared first before a cholecystectomy. The sphincter of ODI is often cannulated using ERCP and a sphincterotomy can be performed to open up the common bile duct to allow for the flow of any retained stones. Usually a stent is placed to allow for free flow of bile and then the patient is taken to the operating room for cholecystectomy and perhaps a cholangiogram. If a patient presents with jaundice, we usually make the assumption that the common bile duct is somehow involved. Either it's filled with stones or perhaps it's being occluded by cancer, a tumor of the pancreas. Ultrasonography has about a 50% sensitivity when there is no ductal dilatation and 75% sensitivity if the duct is dilated greater than 0.8 centimeters. CT scanning has about the same sensitivity as ultrasonography in detecting a common duct stone. However, CT scanning will show us a mass in the head of the pancreas. MRCP has a sensitivity greater than 90%, but it also is slower and more expensive. The advantage is it does not require any iodinated contrast or invasive procedures. However, if ultrasound or CT or MRCP shows cholelithiasis or cancer, it'll be necessary to open the bile duct by performing an ERCP, a sphincterotomy, whereby the sphincter fibers are actually cut, and placing a stent to allow the bile to drain. ERCP deserves consideration if the non-invasive procedures are not successful. The plus with ERCP is that it is both diagnostic and therapeutic. The sensitivity exceeds 90% and the therapeutic sphincterotomy can be performed at the same time. Patients presenting with gastritis may complain of epigastric discomfort. They have no peritoneal signs, no guarding or rebound. The underlying gastritis can be erosive and or can be vascular, such as watermelon stomach. Causes of gastritis are many, stress, non-steroidal medications, drinking alcohol, and Helicobacter pylori infection are all common causes. There are complications to peptic ulcer disease. Collectively, peptic ulcer disease refers to gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcers regardless of the cause. There are complications to duodenal ulceration. These include perforation and bleeding, most commonly from the gastroduodenal artery. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is a result of persistent gastritis and perhaps even gastric outlet obstruction. Gastric outlet obstruction results when the pyloric channel becomes so inflamed and so edematous from underlying peptic ulcer disease, i.e. a duodenal ulcer, that the stomach can't empty. The stomach subsequently becomes enlarged. This results in persistent reflux. The treatment for duodenal ulcers today is often proton pump inhibitors, Nexium, Prilosec, Axid, or H2 blockers, such as Tagamet or Zantac. Multiple antibiotics combined with Pepto-Bismol are used with PPIs to treat a Helicobacter pylori infection. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is often the result of underlying gastritis combined with reflux of acid up into the esophagus from a weakened lower esophageal sphincter. Treatment for gastroesophageal reflux disease includes some modifications in lifestyle, weight loss, avoiding the foods or drugs that cause heartburn, taking antacids can help, PPIs and H2 blockers, stress management, and occasionally anti-reflux surgery, such as a Nissen fundoplication, an operation where the fundus of the stomach is wrapped around the esophagus to recreate a esophageal sphincter and decrease the risk of reflux disease. Even though we won't focus on it in this presentation, pelvic pain, either right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, or suprapubic pain can be caused by a host of gynecological disorders. This presentation will not focus on those disorders such as salpingitis, an ovarian torsion, tube, ovarian, abscess, ectopic pregnancy, pelvic inflammatory disease, sexually transmitted disease, cystitis, 
etc. You'll get a lot of these in your upcoming GI course. The point is, not all abdominal pain is secondary to the GI tract. Don't forget about the female parts in those women who present to the emergency room with radiating pain in the pelvis. A gynecological cause of right lower quadrant or left lower quadrant pain can be ovarian torsion or an ectopic pregnancy. In these two images, we can see the twist in the fallopian tube. The ovary is seen in both images as a large white structure. And in the image on the right, we can see how the fallopian tube not only is twisted, but has subsequently become infarcted. It'll have to be removed on that side. We haven't done justice to the topic of abdominal pain until we've mentioned psychological causes of acute and chronic abdominal pain. This is a lot more common than what you think. Despite how common psychologically induced abdominal pain is, it must remain a diagnosis of exclusion. You must rule out those other life-threatening disorders before you can blame a patient's abdominal pain on psychological or stress issues. Patients usually present with multiple bodily complaints, often that make no sense at all. They've been complaining of the same chronic, non-progressive clinical course that may span many years. This is truly chronic pain without a cause. Somatic symptoms of depression can include early morning awakening, fatigue, altered appetite, and decreased libido. Don't forget, this pain is very real to the patient. The power of the mind over the body is impressive, and there are many disorders caused psychologically that are very real and demand treatment. In the psychological causes of abdominal pain, the patient may present with unrealistic and nonsensical causes of their pain. Inconsistent or distractible physical findings are often suggestive of this sort of discomfort and can lead one to a diagnosis of psychologically induced abdominal pain. In the absence of true physical exam findings, don't waste your time on performing an exhaustive workup on these patients. These patients are very real, their pain is very real, but it should be treated not with surgery or medications, but perhaps by psychological intervention. This is our last clinical presentation. We have a 70-year-old male who presents with acute abdominal pain. He appears psychotic. He has abnormal behavior with neuropsychiatric symptoms present. The abdominal exam is completely benign in spite of his complaint of this acute episode of pain. We obtain the usual workup and we notice that the urine appears dark red. What should we do now? What is your possible diagnosis? And at least in theory, following the red urine scheme, should give us the same outcome as following the abdominal pain scheme. Once you're greater than at least 90% that your patient is suffering from an acute psychotic episode of abdominal discomfort, you can evaluate him and proceed at a gradual pace. Know the patient, get the old records, and try to understand the problem. Then, and only if needed, should you undertake a more extensive workup. Interpret accurately the true quality and quantity of the patient's experience. Thorough psychological and psychosocial history is necessary to try to elucidate the cause of this patient's pain. Psychological, ethnic, and social factors can all contribute. Remember, this is a diagnosis of exclusion and last resort. Psychological abdominal pain can be an acute onset or can even be chronic. It can be secondary to underlying depression, stress, anxiety, opiate withdrawal, and sometimes even irritable bowel syndrome. But remember, the most important is that this is a diagnosis of exclusion. Psychological abdominal pain won't kill the patient, but if you miss an underlying real diagnosis related to pathology of the intra-abdominal or pelvic cavities, you can kill a patient. Here's a famous case from history, the madness of King George. King George had his first attack of porphyria at about the age of 50 at a state dinner in 1788. Subsequent attacks caused outbursts requiring him to be restrained in a straitjacket and bound to a chair. He was considered to be mad. However, there were clues. Medical records show that he had dark red urine, a sign of porphyria, but hair analysis also revealed that he had an abnormal amount of arsenic, over 300 times the normal toxic amount. 
Porphyria attacks can be triggered by medications, including alcohol, hormones, and even arsenic, and some common medications. Other metabolic causes of abdominal pain include diabetic ketoacidosis, lead poisoning, acute narcotic withdrawal, and of course, arsenic poisoning, which apparently was missed. On the previous slide, I put a link to a discussion of the King's porphyria diagnosis, as well as his arsenic poisoning. It appears that arsenic was used to treat his porphyria. Nevertheless, we're not quite finished yet with our psychological discussion of abdominal pain. Let's continue and take a look at porphyria. So in a patient who presents with an acute abdominal attack of pain secondary to porphyria or even arsenic poisoning, they can present with a rigid abdomen, but the pain is wandering. It doesn't localize well. It can be colicky and spasmodic. Often the associated other signs include an encephalopathy, a peripheral neuropathy, and anemia are often associated features. Lead poisoning is also known to trigger an attack of porphyria and to cause these exact same symptoms. A urine coproporphyrian test is more reliable than serum lead levels. Now, this is a rare disorder, and I've never seen a case of porphyria, at least knowingly. If we look at the table here, it outlines the biochemical profile of porphyrias. Please don't memorize this. I only place it here to show you that there are multiple different types of porphyria and they all could present differently. What I do recommend is in the workup of your patient, if you cannot find the cause of the patient's abdominal pain and before you send them to the psychiatrist, you might want to look at heavy metal poisonings. So let's look at chronic abdominal pain. Is it more than 24 hours old? Does it recur? And we have to identify all of those other quality and quantity questions. Where is the pain located? How bad is it? What's the quality? What does it feel like? What causes it? What causes it to recur? How can you make it better? What are some accompanying factors? And give us a chronological sequence of the symptoms. Of course, you'll need to complete a history and physical and do lab and imaging as needed. However, personally, I differ that with the definition of chronic abdominal pain being more than 24 hours old. To me, chronic abdominal pain is something that has persisted for months and now presents with an acute exacerbation. In chronic abdominal pain, whether it's persisted longer than 24 hours or if you use my definition of persistent over several months and now with an acute exacerbation, we still need to perform the history and physical exam. We need to find out those characteristics of the pain, what causes it, what makes it better. We need to see if there's a family history of something similar. And we need to find out the relationship of the pain to eating. What was eaten? When we ate it? Has there been prior abdominal surgery? Does the patient have blood in their bowel movements? Is it a relationship to the menses that perhaps causes the pain? You have to do the complete physical exam, including the rectal and pelvic exams. And really, our workup will be no different. We need to perform the history, the physical exam, assess the exacerbating factors or the alleviating factors. We need to find out if the patient uses tobacco products, if they're nicotine dependent. Do they have underlying atherosclerotic disease? Has the patient had a recent colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy? If so, what were the findings? The usual labs and urinary analysis need to be performed and if you suspect underlying pancreatitis, it might be helpful to check the lipid panel. And of course, don't forget imaging, ultrasound, CT, or MRI. Basically, the workup's going to be the same. You should become familiar with chronic abdominal pain that presents as generalized in nature, and it's a functional etiology. It's called irritable bowel syndrome, and it's very common. If you'd like to read the diagnostic criteria, and the Rome criteria for this, just double click on the presentation here. The Rome criteria indicates recurrent abdominal pain or discomfort at least three days out of the month for the past three months and an onset at least six months before the diagnosis. There's improvement of the pain with defecation and the onset is associated with a change in frequency of stools.
The onset is associated with a change also in the form of the appearance of the stool, and often there's associated passage of mucus. Altered stool passage with straining, urgency, and incomplete evacuation often leave the patient feeling very uncomfortable and seeking medical advice. But now let's turn our attention to something that isn't benign. We just spoke about irritable bowel syndrome, which is benign, alternating constipation and diarrhea. But ulcerative colitis can also present as generalized chronic abdominal pain. This is an idiopathic diffuse inflammatory disease of the mucosa, as shown by the image here. The symptoms include tenismus, urgency, bloody diarrhea, fever, anorexia, weight loss, and diffuse abdominal pain sometimes with guarding in the left upper quadrant, which is the most common site for ischemia. However, with ulcerative colitis, as opposed to Crohn's disease, which we'll talk about in a minute, ulcerative colitis usually only affects the rectum and the colon. It does not affect any other areas of the body. There is an increased risk of cancer with ulcerative colitis, which correlates with how long the patients had the disease and the age of diagnosis. It typically occurs in adolescents and young adults and is usually managed now today with anti-inflammatories and monoclonal antibody-based drugs. So I mentioned Crohn's disease in the previous slide. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis collectively are referred to as inflammatory bowel disease. Crohn's disease can affect any part of the digestive system, from the mouth where it causes aphthous ulcers to the anus where it can cause fistulas. It can usually occur in the terminal ileum and has a name also associated with it of terminal ileitis. Ulcerative colitis, as I mentioned, usually affects the rectum, the descending colon, but is in and of itself defined to the colon. Both today are treated with monoclonal antibody-based medications and occasionally surgery is still needed for the complications of these diseases. Complication of Crohn's disease, such as fistula and perforation, and the complications of ulcerative colitis, such as perforation, colon cancer, bleeding, and megacolon. Crohn's disease appears as a chronic relapsing inflammatory disease, and it has associated symptoms that are autoimmune-like dysregulated response to microbial intestinal flora, and it has skip lesions, meaning it can occur anywhere throughout the uh, gastrointestinal tract. Complications such as strictures, fistula, abscesses, and perforation are noted in both of these, although much more common in Crohn's disease will we see a perforation, stricture, and a fistula. The peak onset of Crohn's disease is usually in the 20s and 30s, uh, and the terminal ileum is the most common initial presentation, but it can occur anywhere. So when we talk about inflammatory bowel disease, we note that diarrhea, chronic abdominal pain, and alternating constipation and diarrhea can also occur. But as mentioned, the diarrhea and the pain usually occurs in the right lower quadrant in 80% of patients suffering from Crohn's disease, i.e. terminal ileitis. Weight loss, fever, vomiting, perianal discomfort from perianal fistulas, and rectal bleeding are common in both complaints. But remember, the rectum is usually involved in ulcerative colitis, whereas the rectum is not usually involved in Crohn's, although it can occur in the rectum. Autoimmune disorders are often seen with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, such as arthritis, ankylizing spondylitis, uveitis, of which there's a picture here, erythema nodosum, aphthous oral ulcers, which we can see in the adjoining picture, and pyoderma gangrenosum, a skin disease. All of these are extra intestinal manifestations, which occur in about 15 to 20 percent of cases. Here's an example of a patient suffering from the extra intestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease. The patient has fistulas occurring between his salivary gland and the skin on his face. You can see in the left image the multiple fistula occurring over the zygomatic processes and the CAT scan clearly shows the open communication between the skin and the underlying parotid gland. 
So this slide tells us what we already know, and that is the workup of abdominal pain, whether it's chronic or acute, should usually consist of many of the same tests and workup, as well as radiological procedures. So take a minute, moving from the upper left aspect of the slide down towards the lower right aspect, and assess whether you think this patient is urgent or something you can wait on. The lady in the upper left photograph is holding her abdomen. Whether she needs to be seen urgently will often depend on the history, as is true of the two men. And the pain, which appears to be obvious in that patient holding the right lower side of his abdomen, seems like he might have underlying appendicitis or even a kidney stone. The child doesn't look very comfortable either. Of course, the gallbladder has shown looks gangrenous, as does the piece of bowel appears to be congested and or partially infarcted. And appendicitis and a ruptured aneurysm all should get our attention immediately. I share your frustration if three of the five presented cases appeared as being very rare and obscure disorders, such as porphyria or arsenic poisoning, and two patients who presented with abdominal discomfort and turned out to have myocardial infarctions. It's good to remember that abdominal pain can be secondary to other disorders outside of the abdomen. But in this presentation, it's always nice to show those common disorders. And hopefully we've covered all of that here. We've looked at gastric outlet obstruction, duodenal ulceration, gastric ulceration, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, appendicitis, bowel obstruction, sigmoid volvulus, and cecal volvulus, and we've looked at psychiatric disorders too. It's all here. It's re resulted in a very long presentation, but I hope you found it useful, and I hope that you take the opportunity to read the notes on each slide and to complete the small quiz at the end.